We're delighted to have Audrey Reed and Bailey Shelton and Linda Southward with us today. And Audrey, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's let's hang on just a couple seconds. I see a lot of folks are coming in. Um, and then we're going to show a short video to give an introduction to the Children's Foundation. Um, and after that, we'll dig into um, what we want to share with you guys today. Are you guys ready to share the video, Dr. Southward? Yes. Okay, great. Every child in Mississippi is born with a chance to be great. We can learn anything, be anything, and change everything. For Mississippi to reach its potential, we must make sure our state's children reach their potential. From health to school to the economy, the world we create now will guide our journey to success. But right now, we're missing opportunities to do the right thing at the right time when taking action will be most effective. That's where the Children's Foundation of Mississippi comes in. The mission is simple, to strengthen, restore, and extend the roles that move Mississippi's children forward. My name is Linda Southward, and I'm honored to serve as director of the Children's Foundation of Mississippi. The Children's Foundation of Mississippi was launched in August of 2019. We serve as a convener, a facilitator, and catalyst to promote evidence-based solutions on behalf of Mississippi's children. We are shaping systems that help children and their families. We are delivering data, and we're building resources. We recognize that success for our children will happen more effectively when we work in partnership with others. When you really boil it down to what affects the future of all the regions of our state, it, it comes down to the condition and opportunities for our children. There are a lot of silence that exists in this space in Mississippi and everybody is very well intentioned but we need someone that can bring all of those different constituencies together. The Children's Foundation of Mississippi can play that role. Bringing a lot of people together that represent different sectors in Mississippi, the business community, the philanthropic community, the nonprofit community, public sector folks, all coming together to focus on an issue that's common to each one, and that's early childhood. There's nothing more important than that. And when we can all focus on how we create better outcomes for kids in this state, then we're gonna have a better economy. We're gonna have a healthier uh, set of people living in Mississippi. We're gonna have more people wanting to move here and become part of Mississippi's economy. And it's gonna be positive for everybody involved. What we have today is the product of what we have done for 150 years. We've gotta change that. We've got to improve. We cannot continue working in our silo. But we know we have seen that investments pay off in individual lives. We just like to see more systems change. This is not a, a state or a region or a community that builds opportunity at the earliest stages of life then it's not going to be a community or a region or a state that's reaching its potential. I think that it's going to take all of us coming together to really focus on those issues in a way that we haven't before. It matters a lot. I don't know any parent who wouldn't want their child to learn to the best of their ability. It's like a ton of pounds off your back. Just to know that your kid loves her teacher, loves her school, loves her classmates. It's a relief. Early childhood education is one of those things where you always heard the, uh, the, the, the old phrase is you don't get a second chance. If you don't get it right the first time, there's very few opportunities to correct it as a child grows older. The state has to look at this as an investment. Everything I hear, if they're behind at third grade, they never catch up. 
So if they can get started at a level playing field with all the other kids, they're setting themselves up for success for the rest of their life. And if we can help them get started, you know, who loses? Nobody loses. We're, we're all we're all winners there. We've chosen to invest in the Children's Foundation of Mississippi because we see it as a unique, new, collaborative entity that will push forward an agenda for children in Mississippi. There are plenty of individuals and organizations and foundations uh, that want to be a part of the solution of building a brighter future uh, for Mississippi. And I just think the Children's Foundation is a vehicle that can help truly make a difference. And I don't think there's any question we're going to have a better Mississippi for all of us. We've got to find a way to uh, protect and promote our most precious resource, and that is our children. Children comprise about 25% of our population in Mississippi, but they are 100% of our future. Together we can create a Mississippi that promises a bright future for all children. The Children's Foundation of Mississippi. Let's build the road to tomorrow. Okay, so thanks, Audrey, for showing the video, and thanks, everyone, for being here today. First of all, thank you. Thank you for not only being here, but thank you for what you do every day in the classroom, in the community, in your dedication to the education of children of all ages in Mississippi, and we're so grateful. And this is really what you just heard on the on the video to think about policy and systems change on behalf of Mississippi's children. And we really you see the hashtag there, turn the curve. That's really what we want to do um, as a organization. And we began August of 2019, which was seven months before the pandemic began. But we feel like we've been able to hear the needs out there through research, through you, you saw excerpts from um, the first summit that we had, which was March the 17th of 20, um, 2022. And then we just had one um, January of this year. So we're hoping to have these annual summits and we'd love for you to come. You also saw highlighted in the video a pre-K collaborative out of Monroe County, Mississippi, and the veterinarians there in that particular um, uh, video uh, excerpt, we're really talking about the importance of early care and education, and also uh, they are contributing to the tax credit for the pre-K collaborative in their particular county. So we've been able to partner with a lot of, of really wonderful organizations since we have been uh, launched some of the ones that you have just seen on the video, also with the Mississippi Economic Council, the Harvard School of Public Health, the University of Alabama School of Public Health, Tougaloo uh, College, Mississippi State University, and we're really wanting to expand that reach of um, students in Mississippi um, to be a part of the Children's Foundation as well. So we're really pleased about where we are and the growth that we have uh, thus far. As I mentioned, we were launched in 20, uh, August of 2019. In January of 2020, uh, Mississippi Kids Count, and, and many of you may be familiar with the um, Kids Count uh, data book and fact book, and Audrey Reed, who works with closely with the Children's Foundation as an, as a um, principal investigator with the Lucid Data, will has been working with us with Kids Count and will continue to work on an even more uh, significant role during 2023. Uh, and then you'll also hear from, uh, and, and she also will in a little while after after I finish, we'll talk about some research that's been done with youth in foster care. And then after, uh, I may be out of order here, but Bailey Shelton, who's our communications outreach 
manager, coordinator for the Children's Foundation. We'll also talk about an exciting project, um, one that was announced by Entergy at our summit in January, but since then we have more details and more specifics about how that will work. So we're really excited about that. So a couple of things that you may or may not have seen in the next slide is really looking at the blueprint. So again, we began in August of 2019, and as our board came together, we began to think about there's so many issues and so many concerns the Children's Foundation can address in this state, but we can't be everything to everyone. Um, so we thought about this, did research, we brought in some graduate students, and the first uh, blueprint, phase one, we're calling it now, came out in June of 2021. These were the four areas that came up. And, uh, and again, we knew the digital divide was going to be, was already evident, but certainly when COVID hit, that became even more um, of a concern. But we know the importance of developmental screening, quality early care education, and the importance of a state-based earned income tax credit. The first two, we have uh, worked more in depth. The digital divide, we worked in partnership with others, and the state-based earned income tax credit is still on the horizon. And then, because children, as you all know, as educators, different milestones, um, there's, there's a huge amount of difference between different ages and among different ages of uh, young children and older children. So then the second one, which just came out in December, uh, and they're both on our, on our website, um, the areas there that you see the such importance of comprehensive health education, life skills in, in post-graduation, um, access to mental health services, and Mississippi youth in transition. And this may be a good segue, I think, probably to the next slide with Audrey will take it from here um, on a survey that was done um, a year or so ago. So Audrey? Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about some of our findings. We conducted a survey um, and some focus groups um, with youth who are in foster care or recently transitioned out of foster care. So we asked them about their educational goals, their mental health and physical health, um, their experiences with housing insecurity, among other topics. These these were the topics that I felt um you guys might be really interested in knowing about. Um, and I was hoping to glean from you all whether you receive information about if students in your class are in foster care. And if so, um, while I'm chatting through the data, if you want to share any tips that you have for other teachers in the room on how you give extra support to those students in your class, I think that would be um, really helpful for other teachers who may not have had to deal with that yet. Um, and we know those children require some extra support and um, and some love during those times. So regarding education, we asked youth about their goals, um, and most of them responded that they were really interested in attending college, community college, or a trade school to further their educations after high school. Um, however, a lot of folks mentioned barriers that um, maybe caused a delay in those goals or prohibited them from um, entering those kinds of programs, such as cost, access to child care, and work schedules. And then to further complicate that journey, only about 20% of youth were confident in their knowledge of accessing um, the free college tuition that fo foster youth are eligible for. We also asked about health and a little more than half of the participants reported ease of accessing physical health care, but that was not the same story um, when it came to mental health care. This is really concerning for this population in particular because we also found in this survey that um, youth have you, these youth in our in our survey had about a five times more likelihood to have symptoms of a serious mental illness than youth in Mississippi or the U.S. population at large. Um, when we asked. About 
about housing, about half of youth we spoke to had experienced some kind of housing insecurity, with participants reporting this five times more frequently than youth nationally. Um, further, the likelihood of future housing insecurity increased with each foster placement. So for example, youth who had had two foster homes was significantly less likely than someone who had had five foster, foster homes to experience housing insecurity later in life. I just popped into the chat to see what you guys are talking about, and Sherry shared that they are not told if students are in foster care and that it would be good to know. So that's a really good note. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Bailey, who's going to talk about that Intergy collaboration. Hey, y'all. My name is Bailey Shelton. I'm the communications and outreach coordinator for the Children's Foundation of Mississippi. Um, I'm a product of Mississippi Public Schools, and I'm a two-time graduate from the University of Southern Mississippi. So um, I'm very passionate about all the things we are talking about today. And this is a really exciting project that um, we partnered with Intergy for, um, and it's called Kids to College. And um, Audrey, if you'll go two slides over, skip the map real quick, um, then I'll get back to one more. Yeah. So what is this program? Um, My529 is a child savings account program. Um, these child savings accounts are designed specifically for post-secondary education. CSAs allow families to put money away to start saving for their children to attend two or four year college, trade school or technical school. Fun fact, when a family plans for their, their child's future by setting aside funds for college, the child is four times more likely to complete a degree. Um, something awesome about this savings account program is that the money can go toward anything education related post-secondary. So even if only $75 you know, was saved in this account, you could still use that for textbooks, um, you know, school supplies, that kind of thing, if you can prove that it's for education. So that is um, a really exciting opportunity. Um, Audrey, you can go back now to the first one. There we go. So what is the goal of Kids to College? The goal is to grow low and moderate income family savings for post-secondary education or training, thereby increasing the likelihood for educational attainment and future earning power. The Children's Foundation's role is we're the administrator for Mississippi. Um, Intergy launched this in a few different states. So for Mississippi, we're the administrator for the project. Um, and what is Intergy's role? Intergy is going to be matching $50 to the account, to eligible accounts. Um, and we'll get to that in a second but they'll be offering um, $60,000 over the next few years through this program and grants money toward these savings accounts. So this could really, um, you know, jumpstart a lot of good for a lot of families that may not be thinking about this yet. Um, so on the next slide, I have a map of Intergy counties. So where is this applicable? Um, Central West, Mississippi. Um, so starts in DeSoto and then goes down to, I think that's Walt Hall. I'm in the middle of every night. I've been trying to um, take quizzes, learning all the counties in Mississippi where they are. So that's been really fun. Um, but so that's where it's um, applicable to get the match. Anyone in Mississippi can sign up for the program. Anyone can open the college savings account and do the investment. Um, just to get the match, you have to be an Intergy customer specifically. Um, we can go to the next one, which I already kind of went over. Yes. So how does it work? Um, you can open a free account, invest your savings. Um, once the beneficiary reaches 18, the money can be used for other tuition and other qualified expenses. They cannot access the money in the account until the beneficiary is 18. Um, so it does have the a forced opportunity to grow, basically. Um, and you can open a different account for each child within a house. So um, if there are three children under the age of 16, 
living in a house under one Entergy account, you can still make three different, you'll, you'll make three accounts, um, one for each child. So how will Entergy help? Like I said, um, Entergy will be matching $50 um, to your saved $50. So when an account reaches $50, that is when Entergy will then make the match. Um, they will not put $50 in just for making the account. Um, it's been really cool already to kind of see how some of these have been growing. Some families have already put in their $50 um, and gotten their matches. And so that's going to be really awesome for these kids that are, you know, in kindergarten and first grade. It's going to be really, um, really substantial to see, you know, the growth in those accounts. So who is eligible? Your child must be 16 or younger. Um, the family is an Entergy customer. If, if you are a renter and the landlord pays for the Entergy, you just have to have the account number for that address. And my role is to confirm, that's one of my roles with this, is to confirm that that household is an Entergy household. So that's really great to know that um, renters, you know, anyone who lives in a house that is an energy customer can still use it as long as I can confirm that the address matches the account, you know, that they're living in and all of that. Um, family has an annual income at or below 52,000 for single earner households and 60 for dual earner households. Um, and one account per child and you have to save at least $50. So um, it's a pretty streamlined process. This is the page on my 529. That link is really long and confusing. So I just gave our children's foundation link that will take you to the my 529 link. Um, but if you go to this, my 529 page um, for this project specifically, it'll just take you through a little online form questionnaire. It's very straightforward. I've been through it. Um, and it'll ask you, you know, all your personal, all the personal information for us to be able to get the account started, but then also, um, the investment options, um, how quickly, how aggressively you want it to grow and things like that. So it is, you know, malleable, um, for each family. So that is really it on that. Um, some of you I know may not be in Energy Counties, but this is Mississippi. I'm sure you have a family member or a best friend somewhere in one of those counties um, who could benefit from this. Um, I have a lot of brochures that I'm happy to mail to any libraries or community centers or schools that would want to have them in a, you know, lobby waiting room public area. I'm also happy to come to any school event and talk about this program and help people get signed up. Um, I'm going to be attending a few kindergarten registration days and some back to school nights, um, open houses, things like that. So my email is there on the screen, um, baileychildrensfoundationms.org. I am absolutely happy to come travel anywhere and come speak about this program, about other things, Children's Foundation related, about the data anything like that, because uh, we really want to make sure we especially tap into the kids in the areas that, um, you know, we might miss over sometimes. So I'm not, af not afraid to go where I need to go. And I'm looking forward to watching this program grow. And my email's there if any of y'all would like to follow up and chat later on. Awesome. And if y'all have any questions too, yeah, y'all can just put them in the chat or we'll save time for a Q and a at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you guys want to, um, add any questions, I'll kind of compile them and we'll go through them, um, at the end of the session. So one of the other resources we really wanted to talk to you guys about is the kids count data center. Dr. Southward, um, shared at the beginning that the children's foundation is the hub for the Mississippi data center. Um, and this is where you can find data all about children and families in your specific county or your school district um, or the state at large. So I wanted to show you a little bit of the data that you might find useful um, and how to kind of navigate the, um, the website. 
Um, and since we are the home, the hub of the data center, if you have any questions about this um, or you're looking for specific data, please feel free to email us. We would be happy to talk to you guys um, if you think that this would be a beneficial kind of thing to do a deep dive on with your staff or your administrators. Um, I'm happy to chat with you guys and, and set up a time to go, go into a little bit more detail on this. Um, and we have our email and our socials listed at the end of this presentation. So please just reach out and we'll, um, I love talking data. So I will, I will get on the phone with you and, and chat through how you can use this data to, um, your advantage. I'm going to switch over my sharing screen. All right, so this is the landing page for the data center. Are you guys seeing that? Yeah, okay, great. So um, it is located at datacenter.kidscount.org um, and it gives you a nice map. You can, you can look at any state, any state's data. Um, I love doing regional comparisons, seeing how our neighbors are faring in different um, areas, educational areas, and um, comparing those against Mississippi. And I'll kind of show you how you, you might be able to do that too. So I this is how I get to it. Um, I think it's the easiest way. I'm sure that there's a more direct way that I don't know what that is. Um, so I click into Mississippi and look at, let me make this a little bit bigger. Right. So this is what it would look like on your desktop. And you can see all of the different um, indicators that Kids Count collects. And so these data are collected across a, ver a variety of different surveys um, and kind of compiled here for your convenience. And over to the left, you can limit it by things that you, um, you can look at by your county specifically. Um, so you've got some demographic information, some um, employment data, and public assistance and poverty, some economic variables, and some educational variables. Um, you can also look at some school district data, like kindergarten readiness, children poverty, child's poverty. That's one that we look at a lot. And graduation and dropout rates are also extremely relevant. So I was going to take you guys through a couple of indicators that you might find really interesting. Um, so let's start with child food insecurity. Um, so over here, you've got each of the counties. Um, you can, you know, deselect all of them and just just select your county. And you can also compare it to the state at large. So we can see in Mississippi overall in 2020, about 20.4% 20 of children were experiencing food, um, food insecurity um, versus 15% in um, Alcorn County. You can also limit it by the year that you're interested in. I always choose the most recent couple of years um, so that I'm getting the most up-to-date information. And you can also, one of the things that I really enjoy is pulling up these maps um, and looking at county level comparisons. So this is that same variable of child food insecurity. And you can see a really, get a really good quick snapshot of what the state is looking like for this variable. Um, and this might be of interest to you guys in the classroom. Um, if you're in one of those high child food insecurity areas, you know, you, you may have certain things that you um, want to target. I've seen a lot of teachers have in classroom kind of pantries or um, resource closets and things like that. Um, and depending on what... Um, 
issues your county or your school district has, you may, um, you know, change your tactics up. And of course, you guys know your students probably better than what we can capture in county level data. So this is also um, a great resource to share with administrators as um, or for administrators to access as they are looking for ways to help in the community or help um, families in their area specifically. So we've got a lot of family data. Um, one trend that I'm looking closely at is our immigration rate in Mississippi is, is trending upward. Um, so let me pull that up real quick. So our children and immigrant families is rising. And with that, um, we may be seeing some language barriers with families and things like that. Um, so that's something that I'm personally keeping an eye on and that your school administrators might be keeping an eye on as well. So one thing, another thing that I like to do with this data is um, create kind of data um, infographics, if you will. Um, and I would love to create some of those for you guys or with you guys um, in kind of a more detailed way in one-on-one -on -one or, you know, kind of like coming into your school or your, um, oh, well, let me admit some folks. Um, or talking to your administration about your specific um, school district and collecting all of the variables that um, that are available for your district um, so that you guys have the best picture of um, what's really going on in your communities. I'm going to pop back over to the presentation. So sorry. Thank you. All right, here we go. All right. And now I'm going to open it up for some questions. Um, all right. So, Dr. Southward, um, popped in to, to remind you guys about. Um, so this information is also downloadable via Excel spreadsheets. So you can have that data um, more easily accessible and use it for a variety of purposes. So you can import those into your reports um, and you know create graphics based on those and grant applications. That's a really good point, Dr. Southward. Thank you for sharing that. Sherry, that's a great question. Is there any way to get school lunch free for all students? Again, that was so wonderful. I totally agree. Um, this presentation will be available soon. That need for the school lunches is one of the, um, one of the things that you can really show through the data center. And that's a really great point, Sherry. Um, I'd love to create kind of a brief about um, food insecurity in Mississippi um, so that hopefully we can start having those conversations with um, the Department of Ed again. Does anybody else have any questions for us? All of the blueprints, fact books, any kind of research or publication that we've done is available on our website. So if you're interested in looking at any of that data, there are PDFs for free downloads on our website. 
Um, so you can browse there. And then any of our other projects or anything that's been mentioned is also um, on the website as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Audrey and Bailey. If I may, I could also uh, give a heads up for um, police check. I would probably say, Bailey, maybe June or July, we will have an RFP process. Last year, and Bailey's been working very closely on this project, last year we sent out an RFP, very, very straightforward, um, for anyone could apply to begin an early childhood council uh, within their community. And this is this is not to be in place of, of anything else that's already out there, but it's an opportunity to get folks to come together in a community. And we have, so we had 57 applications in, in less than a month. We funded nine. And some of you who may have been at the summit in January, you um, heard their presentations. Yeah, there you go. Just pop that in. This isn't part of the presentation, but thanks, Bailey, for popping that right on in there. So you can see where, and they're scattered across the state. What we want to do, what we're planning on is an RFP will be coming out early, probably June, maybe, Um and again, very straightforward. We want to um, fund nine additional um, sites, and we're planning on doing that for the next three years, nine each each year. Um, for example, we know Excel by five, there's probably 40 or 42 communities that are Excel by five communities, and that's absolutely wonderful. Some communities are using the Children's Foundation Early Childhood Council planning grants, and that's all it is. They're planning grants in order to become an Excel by five community, or maybe they're more interested in or interested in well campaign for grade level reading. Maybe they're they're interested in having a pre-K collaborative within their community. And we've seen all of those. Um, well, we definitely have seen uh, Excel by five and pre-K collaborative interest. But we've also been able to make additional connections as we've been out in the communities hearing what people's interests are, what they see as a gap in services. And I'm just very thrilled to tell this group of educators uh, primarily that educators have been at the table in every single community. Sometimes educators are leading the, the conversation. Sometimes it's coming through a public library. We had a chamber of commerce in, in one community step up. Um, United Ways, uh, school districts, um, a child care center or two, I think. So, and, and then there have been some things that have happened just organically. One community, Oakland, Mississippi, that was on the map, what's in Yalabusha County, in Oakland, Mississippi, there are zero child care centers. Well, once we then got all of the grantees together through Zoom and then at the summit, they began to resource with one another. So a child care, I think it's level up in Greenville, Mississippi, where there's lots of child care centers in Greenville, Mississippi. That person is now working with the person in Oakland to say, what are the steps of having a child care uh, center, a licensed child care center in our community? So we were on a Zoom call um, Oh, early this morning. It was a great way to start the day. And this is a wonderful way to end the day with seeing so many folks who are doing great things. And, and then tomorrow afternoon, we'll have a whole lot of other people joining in from these early um, childhood, early education councils. So we've talked a lot about early education today. But we also, that was another important piece to put together um, uh, or to spotlight what Audrey did and the blueprint too. So we're really looking at children zero through eight. We can't be everything to everybody, but of those eight buckets of work that are in the blueprint, these are areas that we're very much interested in. And then we were asked by Entergy to apply for the um, Kids to College grant. So we're really excited about that one as well. Um, and then I, I think in another uh, 
a couple of weeks, you'll hear more. Well, in fact, um, if I might, Patty, Dr. Pimenter, I'm not sure if this is a place to advertise, but if you would check our website in the next week or two, we're going to be advertising for some early childhood outreach coordinator slash parent um, engagement folks to work with the early childhood councils. We already have funded for, and and it's only planning grants, and then to help uh, work alongside Bailey and others as we have additional early childhood counsel. So we're still young as an organization, but we're uh, very excited about the work, and it's so wonderful to get to know people all over the state, and we want to learn from you. You're the experts about education. You're the experts about your community. So so please reach out. We have an email. It's, um, what is it, Bailey, info at childrensfoundationms.org. So reach out to us um, and, and let us know how we can be of help. So anyway, I I talked too much, but I thought I would just go ahead and, and bring those points up because we were a little ahead of, of schedule and I wanted to share the information.